40 years ago, a U.S. Navy exploratory vessel landed on a chain of islands in the South Atlantic, just 2,000 miles off the coast of Argentina. In other words, the middle of nowhere. Yet on this far-off set of rocks afloat in the middle of the ocean, they discovered a vast array of strange wildlife and plant species that resemble little of what they left behind on the mainland. Could this be a treasure trove of undiscovered species, they wondered. Hoping to capitalize on the discovery, a reconnaissance team of researchers was sent out to explore some of the islands on foot, and what they found did not disappoint. From endangered species of birds, to plant life and vegetation that looked like it belonged on Mars, they found a dizzying array of new and exciting examples of evolutionary oddities that would fill a library. But unfortunately, their jubilation was cut short. Attempting to collect soil samples, they dug into the ground and soon discovered that what they were standing on wasn't actually ground at all. The Navy scientists soon discovered the rocky terrain they were exploring was actually made up entirely of organic matter. As per the standard protocol, the SCP Foundation was forced to silence the U.S. Navy research vessel after its discovery. With the okay from the U.S. government, the ship was torpedoed and sunk to the bottom of the ocean with all hands on deck in the name of protecting the greater good of the masses. A tragedy at sea for the sake of preventing worldwide pandemonium. From there, the Foundation took over with the containment procedures of what would eventually come to be known as SCP-169, better known by its nickname, the Leviathan. The Leviathan is a biblical creature of mythical proportions, said to be able to boil the seas and create earth-ending floods with just a whip of its massive continent-spanning body. It is unclear if SCP-169 has the ability to do these things, though, given its massive size which Foundation researchers estimate to be somewhere between 2,000 and 8,000 kilometers. It's easy to see how something that big moving at any speed could be devastating for the coastal regions of the world. Although we use the word contain, it is impossible for SCP staff to ever contain something of such massive size. Surveillance and monitoring are about all we can do for now. That and hope it never wakes up decides that we're on the menu. It was thought to be relatively smooth sailing, until one incident changed everything. Dr. Hart turned off the video monitor and faced the assembled members of MTF Gamma 6, also known as the Deep Feeders, renowned for their specialization in the tracking of deep sea and oceanic anomalies. The room was dark, and each team member was sitting in shadow, but still Dr. Hart could see the seriousness on their faces. I'm sure you're wondering why I called you here at such short notice, he said. On the screen behind him, he put up a NASA satellite picture of a small set of rocky islands. You see this little island chain here? Well, it wasn't there a week ago. He paused, rubbing his forehead from lack of sleep. At 8.05 a.m. today, we recorded another auditory anomaly emitting from SCP-169. This one was much louder and longer than the one recorded in 1997 by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the one known as the Bloop. Back then, it was easy to brush off as some ice breaking off of a continental shelf and scraping against the seafloor. It's not so easy to cover up anymore. These auditory emissions from SCP-169 are beginning to grow more frequent. More than that, Increased seismic activity around the archipelago on the creature's back indicates that the rate at which the creature is breathing is also up. Typically, the rate at which the creature takes what we are assuming to be a breath is once every three months. The rate has increased to once every three weeks. For as long as we've been monitoring SCP-169, it's been adrift along the southern Atlantic, never moving more than a kilometer a week. That behavior is slowly beginning to change. It doesn't sound like much, but something that big even moving just a fraction of that faster means 100-foot tidal waves for the entire South American coastline. We fear the creature is showing signs of waking up. If this is true, it could mean a cataclysm for the hundreds of nations around the world. Millions, hell, even billions could be wiped off the face of the Earth if this thing just flips its body too fast in the wrong direction. To put it to scale, this monster is about the size of the Caribbean. Maybe even bigger, as far as we know. The doctor then pulled out a decanter of whiskey and poured himself a glass, swallowing the entire pour in one go. 
in an appalling breach of workplace professionalism. Seriously, an XK class end of the world scenario is still no excuse for drinking on the job. We're talking about an extinction level event. A bona fide XK class end of the world scenario. 1,000 foot tsunami waves stretching as far as the eye can see from either end of the horizon. The last time SCP-169 stirred, it created the Mediterranean. In fact, the legends of the biblical flood, Noah's Ark, the same story can be found in every civilization and culture around the world. So maybe they were onto something. It is to this end I call you all here, to save the world from the next great flood. He paused for a moment as the room took in the gravity of the situation. The more we can learn about SCP-169, the better. And right now, we know SWAT. For one, we've never seen just how deep the body of the creature goes, or what's under it. The pressure has been too great for our current model submarines. Until now. After reinforcing our NEMA-1 deep sea submersible with thaumaturgical runes, the integrity of its hull has increased exponentially. Your mission will be to travel as far down and as close to the creature as possible. If it breathes, then there must be gills or lungs. There must be some basic biological facts we need to understand if we're going to survive extinction. Our only recourse is to find a way to sedate the creature. And if that doesn't work, then... God help us all. Just 12 hours later, deep in the waters of the Southern Atlantic, a massive submersible ship was diving down into the depths of the deep ocean, looking for a way to stop the end of the world. Agent Jia 6 1, a member of Deep Feeders, looked out of the massive viewing port as the ship slowly descended alongside the rocky trench that made up the body of SCP 169. Behind him was Dr. Hart, sporting a white 5 o'clock shadow and a red nose from a night of drinking to calm his nerves. The entire crew were silent in awe as the giant floodlights of the ship brushed over the barnacle-covered surfaces of the undersea mountain. They progressed slowly, reaching each milestone in depth with caution, knowing that one wrong move could destabilize the pressure in their ship. Just 6 one murmured the word, Scales. What? asked Dr. Hart. I've been watching the patterns of the ridges as we sink down. They look like scales. Giant segments. It's hard to see at first because they're so covered in barnacles and sediment, but I'm sure of it. They're giant, armored scales, the way lobsters or crabs have armored exoskeletons. Interesting, the doctor said, scratching his chin. Arthropods have segmented armored bodies. This means we might be looking at some sort of evolutionary hybrid, some sort of aquatic mammal, such as a whale or dolphin. But one that has developed armored segmented scales similar to that of a crustacean. The doctor crossed his arms to think. The closest thing we have on the fossil record of this magnitude is an armored fish from the Cretaceous period. But even that's way too small to compare to this. This thing has an entire ecosystem on its back. How old is it? Asked the agent. Well, now that you mention it, given the impossible age of the creature, an arthropod would make sense. Lobsters and other crustaceans don't age conventionally, you see. They are effectively immortal. In fact, they actually die because they continue to grow until their bodies can't hold up their humongous size anymore. And yet, SCP-169 just kept growing. The doctor trailed off, thinking to himself. Dr. Hart, still lost in thought, turned to walk to the back of the submersible as Zhe 6-1 followed. He said as much to himself as to the agent, The creature is old. The geological survey conducted when SCP-169 was first discovered carbon dated the specimen to over 541 million years old. As you can probably surmise, that's too old for any living being. The results had to be incorrect, and yet I checked them myself more than once. The numbers do not lie. The entity predates our civilization. Hell, it predates complex life forms on this planet as we know it. From an evolutionary standpoint, it doesn't make any sense. The agent, confused, asked, Doctor, how could something so big even come into existence? Very little of our planet is actually landmass. It's a wonder we call it Earth. Most of this planet is water. We aren't looking at a creature that's on our planet, agent. We are on its planet. Just then a flurry of alarms and sensors began to go off at the bridge of the ship. The team scrambled through their stations, checking off monitors and shouting readings to each other. The ship's thermal sensors are detecting a massive rise in temperature, transmitting power to cooling systems. We have activity northwest of our location. Sonar has something big headed our way. We need to dive now! The ship lurched forward, nose first, as everyone on board held onto their seats, the restraints keeping them from falling forward. 
Just outside of the viewing port, Dr. Hart could see an enormous scaled appendage moving fast in their location. We need to steer the ship clear of the talons. Revert all power to the thrusters. Get us out of the way, the doctor yelled. Don't you think I'm doing that? The captain shouted back. The ship jolted sideways and downwards as an immense wave of pressure came over the submersible, putting six Gs of force on its occupants. Zhe's 6-1 yelped out of fear as the ship came close to crashing into what appeared to be the edge of a titanic talon the size of the Empire State Building. Following the encounter, the part of the ship bordering the reinforced glass of the viewing port began to glow bright red. It's boiling the water around us! One of the crew members cried out. It's not boiling anything, it's just cavitation due to the pressure reduction in the water. The updated runes on the ship's hull should keep us safe, we just need to cool our heads. Stay focused on the mission bottom feeders. After several moments of holding their breaths, the crew of Nima 1 began to relax as their pace returned to a slow descent along the side of the underwater behemoth. Before long, the vessel was no longer traveling straight down, but starting to curve under the creature, traveling north towards the theoretical head of SCP-169. After several hours, the ship came upon giant fissures in the rocky exterior of the creature. These massive vent-like structures appeared stiff, but slowly they opened and closed over the span of weeks. These were the respiratory organs of the organism. Clocking in at over two miles underneath the surface of the ocean, the crew carefully began entering the smaller pod-like submersibles that detached from their main ship. Zhe 6-1 entered his pod and strapped on the haptic gloves that would give him control of the pod's robotic arms. He and a team of three other volunteers had agreed to undergo the dangerous mission of attaching artificial chemical emission machines that could be programmed to release anesthetic gas into SCP-169's respiratory system on command remotely. The emission machines could be refueled manually whenever the contents ran out. It was an ingenious solution Dr. Hart came up with when thinking of his time studying sharks as a marine biologist. They would tag the fins of sharks by capturing them and bringing the specimens on the deck of their boat. From there, the scientist would drill a radio frequency emitter onto the fin of the shark. When he had first seen this practice as a young college student, Dr. Hart was afraid the process was harming the shark, but later he learned it was designed in a way to not be harmful to the specimen, and eventually the tag would fall off after enough data on the shark's movement was collected. Except these tags would not be falling off, he thought. They could not. For the sake of all mankind, this had to work. The doctor pressed a button on the receiver of the radio and spoke. Just 6-1, what's your status? Pressure's holding, all signs look good. Just 6-2? Pressure's holding, all good. Zhe 6-3, all clear, Captain. Zhe 6-4, there was silence. Zhe 6-4, do you copy? <clears throat> all clear, Doc, sorry, my mic was muted. On route and ready to do this thing. Dr. Hart sighed in relief and slowly reclined in his chair, watching the pods move closer to the large openings on SCP-169's side. One by one, the robotic arms used underwater torches to drill into the thick, rock-like exoskeleton of the creature, screwing in complex million-dollar equipment that was both waterproof and could withstand the immense pressure at such a depth under the ocean. As the minutes turned to hours, Dr. Hart couldn't help but feel anxiety for the safety of his crew and the success of the mission, but before long the pods began to return one by one to the mothercraft, each completing the segment of work with which they were tasked. The last pod still working was Zhe 6-1, whose robotic arm was in the process of rotating a large industrial-sized screw. Zhe 6-1 had all but finished when suddenly a low rumble could be felt shaking the larger submersible. Dr. Hart's voice came crackling over the radio. Get back to the ship now! Zhe 6-1, wrapped in deep focus on his task, replied, I'm just about finished, just packing up my tool belt. Leave it. Return to the ship now. That's an order. Jesus, what's wrong? It's not like this is the end of the world, said the agent, chuckling over his radio. An ear-piercing echo sent shockwaves through the depths of the ocean around the submersible. The waves rumbled with the sound of SCP-169's voice, similar to the sound of a large whale, but amplified by a million. The sound sent all the crew members falling to the floor as the ship experienced severe damage from the burst of pressure, slightly cracking the glass viewport and sending smoke flooding into the small bridge of the ship. Gas masks! shouted Dr. Hart as they all donned breathing apparatus. SCP-169 is waking up. Begin activation of the chemical emission machines. We need to sedate it now. The Leviathan is waking up. We need to stop it. 
shouted Dr. Hart. Just then, he looked back and noticed Je 6-1's pod was gone. Je 6-1, what's your position? Je 6-1, where are you? Sir, Sona has him drifting off deeper into the ocean behind us. He must have gotten knocked off SCP-169 by the shockwave. But Dr. Hart wouldn't have it. He didn't want any more blood on his hands. Reverse thrusters, turn us around and get to him. We're not losing anyone. But the breach in the hull! It'll hold, that's what the runes are for. The outside of the submersible began to glow a slight blue as the ship system started to come back online to full capacity, and alarm systems started to turn off and report normal pressure readings. Before long, the Nemo-1 had caught up to Je-6-1's pod and retrieved the agent, who had been knocked unconscious by the shockwave. Once the agent was back on the main ship, the doctor turned his attention back to the monitors, making sure the installations they drilled into the creature were functional. Slowly, the machines came online to full power, and the speed at which SCP-169 had been moving began to slow ever so slightly. The team all watched the viewport in silence as a steady stream of anesthetic gas was pumped into the respiratory system of the gigantic living myth in front of them. After a few moments of waiting, the doctor spoke. I think it worked, he said with a smile. The crew erupted in cheers as they radioed control back up on land that the mission had been a success. The message quickly reached the O5 Council, where a red alert status was de-escalated, and the O5 members withdrew from their plan of leaving the current Earth for that of an alternate universe. The whole crew began to sing and celebrate the prevention of the end of the world, as Dr. Hart simply stood in front of the massive viewport, watching the mountainous specimen slowly grow smaller in the distance as the submersible began ascending back to the world above. Je 6-1 came over to congratulate him, patting him on the back. We did it! He said. Loosen up! The doctor managed to laugh along in acknowledgement. That we did, he said in relief. That we did. The two watched the deep blue ocean in silence, taking in the vastness of the sea. Perhaps this would not be the end of it, but that day, they had done what the SCP Foundation did best. Kick that apocalyptic can a few miles down the road. And sometimes, in the face of the terrifying and the infinite, that's really the best you can do. Now go check out SCP-3000 Anatashisha and SCP-2316 The Bodies in the Water for more frightening aquatic anomalies.